praise for God's wonderful works. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart and the company of the upright and the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of honor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his coming. He has shown his people the power of his works, and giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praises endure. The word of God for the people of God. Praise God. Amen. As most of you already know, I, I don't often uh, preach from the Psalms, but I've been in such, you know how it, you know how it is with me. I, if, when I'm living it, I share it with you. I, I've always, I try, I, I always try to see God in my daily walk, it, it, it's a good, it's good to do, right? it, it, to, to ask yourself, where is God in this? It, it, it helps keep you, um, it helps keep you from getting too much out of control in, in our emotions. <clears throat> it can help temper us when we're frustrated on the road. It can help temper our, our uh, and how we deal with other people. Uh, I've been sharing with you that the last few weeks I decided after going to the doctors that I, I want to make an effort of taking better care of myself. And um, it's hard, right? It's a hard thing to do. I've, I've uh, preached this a few years ago and, um, <clears throat> and I wasn't able to, although I went strong to start, I wasn't able to maintain that, that, that discipline. And I think, I think most of us relate to that, right? I mean, anyone who's ever done a New Year's resolution or has decided they want <clears throat> to change something in their life, it, 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 we can be really filled with a lot of inspiration and spirit to do it, but we soon discover that it's hard to stay on that path. And the first week I was sharing with you that I was craving a lot of different things, and, and I'm, I'm not just eating healthy right now, I, I am actually dieting. I want to get my weight down to a certain place <clears throat> while I still can, right? I'm, I'm, I'm feeling 45 years old, and I want to feel better. And... Um, and so when you're dieting, I don't know if you have a diet or not, that can be difficult because you hunger. And I was sharing that the mantra when you fast is, do I hunger for God as much as I do of these worldly things? Not to be a broken record, but I do, I do ask you to ask yourself that, do I hunger for God as much as whatever? Not to, not to, re, to, to, you know, to redo all the sermons I've done in the past few weeks. Um, I've realized, though, as I've changed to a healthier diet, that I feel um, my soul has been better. Uh, I'm going into like the third week now, and I feel that I've had more joy in me as I've been walking. I don't know if you've seen me in Westerly. Anybody? Usually, Chris used to see me. He was amazed that I could read and walk at the same time. Uh, and not hit the telephone poles. And not hit the telephone poles that are in the middle of the sidewalks. Um, I started that up again, Chris. Except I've also, I'm, I'm also listening to uh, audio, audio books. Um, as I've been eating healthier, as I've been exercising, and, and I'm, not I'm not jogging and stuff. I'm just getting out and walking my 10,000 steps a day, 10,000 reasons, right? 10,000 steps, praising God, listening to, uh, in my reading, seeing just, I just spent, my soul has been lifted up. So I offer this suggestion to you all, that if you go for a walk, Spend time with someone that you care about. Um, it's good for the soul. Earl knows that um, in the summer, I'm a little late this year though, that I will, um, my dual, I will do my morning sermon prep in the summertime down at Wilcox Park. Has, have you guys all been down there lately? No? Make, before you go back home, right? You guys head down, you go down there, yeah. Um, it's so beautiful, it's so green. It's, um, 
I was just walking this morning and looking around at God's creation and uh, two cardinals um, just flew and stopped right, at, right by my feet. A male and a female cardinal. They were absolutely beautiful. And then I went up to the ducks and they came over to visit with me for a little bit, disappointed that I didn't bring anything for them to eat. And I was just enjoying taking in God's creation. I find it no coincidence that it's, I'm reading um, a book right now, I'm going to be sharing with you a little bit, and it seems like everyone has heard of this man, um, Henry David uh, Thoreau, uh, except for me. I, I'm, just, I'm taking an American philosophy class, and in doing so, I'm going to be reading a lot of um, philosophies and poetries. Um, this of one book, which I find absolutely fascinating, and uh, I'm, I'm soon going to be reading uh, a book on Martin Luther King, I Have a Dream. And so it's just a very uplifting class. I, I'm, I'm surprised to find that... Um, because a lot of times you can be brought down in your schoolwork, right? But in this, I'm being very much lifted up. And um, as I'm reading this book, I'm, uh, I feel like it's so interesting that this class and this, this book has found me right where I am today. And it, it, the timing couldn't be any better. And, and perhaps it's just circumstance, but I think it's God's blessing upon us. That, you know, and it's, it, do we stop and recognize these times that aren't so much of chance or lucky but seen as a true blessing given to us by our living God. So I, I offer you that this week. I mean, we're going to soon... I remember many years ago, we would have Bible study um, in my home church, and then we would finish Bible study in the parking lot. Man, some of the best Bible studies are done in the parking lot of a church. And, and, and my wife would be very upset with me because I would come home some nights at like 1 in the morning. And she's like, where were you? And I'm like, in the church parking lot doing Bible study with my uncle and the pastor. And... She says, how would you like it? I'm like, I'm at the church. But I learned I had to tell her where I was, right? But we would have these, these conversations and talking about this theology on God and who is God in our lives. And it would be so great. And I remember this one time, it was late August, and you could hear the peak toads going, and, and you could see there's still some remnants of the lightning bugs. And, and, and I recognize that, that God's creation is in full bloom. And that's where we are right now. Right? As, as you walk through Wilcox Park around, the, all around your community, you'll see that God's creation is in full bloom, ripe for the picking. And it's so good. It's so good. And it's so easy for us not to see this goodness because we have all these distractions around us. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. But first I want to pick up from last week where it said... Jesus says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. And it just reminds me of how good our God is. When you, you know, I bring the psalm to us today, not to do a theological breakdown, but to say, does my heart leap like David in celebrating the worship of such a good God a God that meets us even in the times of our sorrows and our brokenness. A God that says, I know you hurt today, but tomorrow you shall be filled. A God that will never turn God, uh, his back on us. Do we hunger for this God? Or if not, what are we hungering for? Do we hunger for this bread of life that is given? It's not like we have to wait for it. It's right there there for the taking. It's in full bloom, full harvest, ready to be, to ready for us to consume. Last week I shared a few steps with us on how I believe that we can get a deeper start into this walk with God and, I, and specifically in the Word of God. My, so I'm going to start with just going through the list quick. Pray. Pray unceasingly, but specifically if you're praying for divine revelation in scriptures, before you read the Bible, pray. Our Bible study group, I think, is becoming more and more aware. It, and, and you may have already known this, guys, but I think you're becoming more and more aware in our last couple of weeks' lessons that there are these books in the Bible and that we don't have to read it from Genesis all the way to Revelation, that we can stop and reflect and meditate on one good book. You know, pray and then, and then read it. Read it. And then meditate on what you are reading. Meditate on and reflect on what you read. Don't, don't, let you, don't change what you read. Let the reading change you. You soak in the reading. 
And then we share the reading, not, not to be preachy with the finger out or to, or to necessarily um, have someone think the way we do, but we share the reading like we do in our Bible study so that we both grow. Many a time at Bible study, if not, if not weekly, something that someone will share will give me a new thought. I praise God for that time of fellowship because when I share the scripture and, they sh and someone shares the scripture with me, it gets me out of myself and I can see another element of God that I just didn't see before. And then after you share the reading, instead of trying to convince somebody of how you're right and they're wrong, soak in what they've said, meditate on it again. Reflect upon it on that group discussion. And then the sixth step is simple enough. Repeat. Pray. Pray. So the list is simple. Pray, read, meditate, share, meditate, repeat. It'll change your life, reading the Bible, soaking in the Bible. I, 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 I'm not supposed to make promises I can't keep, but I promise you, if you spend this kind of exercise in the Bible, you'll be hungry for it and you'll never, ever want to leave it. It's not the kind of book you read once and then put aside. It's something that you spend the rest of your life in. Now, I just gave you a typical Pastor Barry exercise. Here's what we're going to do. Here's how you're going to do it. Step one, step two, all the way to six and repeat. And that's, that can be a little cold. So I turn back to the psalm. And this is just the first part of the psalm that Earl read for us today. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. Do we give, do we give praise to anything with our whole heart? In a minute, I'm going to share a quote about the heart. Can we even hear our heart beating? I'll share more in a second. For in the company of the upright in this uh, congregation, great are the works of the Lord. Do we recognize how great the works of the Lord are? Do we feel like the psalmist here? Do we, you can see the energy and the joy in just these few sentences. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of honor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. I was reading this psalm this morning, I mean not this morning, this week, this coming week, in preparation for this sermon, and, and I was just thinking, does my heart praise the Lord like David? So I was talking about Henry David Thoreau. Who, who's heard of him? Um, he's, he's a philosopher at the turn of the um, uh, he, early 19th century, and he... Um, is absolutely fascinating. Um, some describe him as a hermit, which I wouldn't go as far. But he believed in um, dis, uh, simplicity. Simplicity. He, some would con call him an, um, an environmentalist, which he was not. He would have never imagined in a million years, he wanted to get in touch with nature and God's creation. He would have never imagined in a million years that we would be faced with such things upon us at, at, that potentially are happening with climate change and such. The, he never thought that we would have, humans would have the capacity to uh, make such an impact on, on Mother Nature. Um, and so his, his, his connection with nature was not, was not to be, um, to clean the environment up but rather his connection with nature is to clean his life up. He believed that nature is well, too, well strong enough to take care of oneself. But we can find that in Thoreau that, that he is relevant to us today in a society who, who may be damaging ourselves in the way that we treat our world. Now he wouldn't say we need more recycle bins and he wouldn't say uh, things like that. He would rather say, you need to find ways that you don't need to put things in a recycle bin. Something very important about um, Henry Thoreau is, he's not um, preachy in the aspect that he expects people to live his life. He said, far be it from me to have somebody come in and say, I want to live your life. He said, this is my life, and I'm not mocking anyone else how they live. But he wanted to share his journey answering these two questions. And these two questions is, how do I know what I want? And what is my true desire? I believe if we are going to sing songs like the psalmist today in, in, in uh, chapter 111, that, that we have to seek, deeply seek, what is it that I'm after? Where do I find my joy? Where do I find my true desire? And this has been a, a little series that I've been on. I think maybe you've picked up on it. 
And I just thought it was absolutely fascinating that this man spends his life seeking this. He said that there's so many people that are working, um, working, making money, attempting to find some kind of happiness or some kind of fulfillment. Maybe we just need to work harder at living. He shares a story of how we can minimize his, uh, his life. It's, it's very funny. He says this man says to him that he, he was very turned off by the train. This is the modern technology that's coming through. He didn't like the idea of this. And he said, you know, this gentleman said to me that he, he's going to venture on a 30-mile journey. He says, you have to work almost an entire day to pay for, a day's fee, for that fare. So you have to do one day's pay to pay for the fare on this train. So he says, I wager that you will work a day and then be on your way tomorrow morning for your destination, where if I leave this morning, I'll be there this afternoon. And it got me really thinking. It's like, at first it made me thought it was a riddle, but I'm like, no, it's like, what are these things that we're always hungering after in the tomorrow rather than celebrating the blessing of the today and the now? He said, if there was a track that could circle the entire earth with a train, he said, I would bet you that if I set off by foot and you were trying to work your way around, that I would always be ahead of you. He asked this really big question. He felt like commercialism was out of control. And this is, remember, like 1820s? And he would walk through town, and he would see all these stores trying to get his attention through advertising, whether it be the cobbler or or the seamstress or whatever. He said, all this, everywhere you look, he says, there's commercials. <laughs> That's interesting, isn't it? And he said, I, I, and he didn't like it one bit, you know? And he said, there's so many distractions as I walk through town that how can I even hear my own heart? Remember when you were little? Maybe, maybe you still do that. Maybe, maybe some of you are active. Remember when you were little and you run so hard and you'd lay down on the grass that you could hear your heart pounding? Have you ever done that? Boom. And you can hear it. Boom. Boom. Now, if I ran like that, my pot probably would st still do this, right? Although I might have my hand clenched in, in worry rather than a big smile. But I remember this as a child just running as fast as you can and then laying down on the grass and you can hear your own heartbeat. You know? What a, what a memory if you experience this. And he's saying, I can't, as I walk through this town, and I picture Wesley's probably one of the closest things to, to the 1800s as far as shops go that you're gonna find in these parts, right? He says, you look around at all this advertising and, and, and I can't even hear my own heartbeat. Do you realize that the last statistic I read on this was that we spend a year of our life watching commercials? I don't, he, if it was bad in the 1800s, man, what would it be now? Thoreau was a minimalist with material things so he could maximize life. It wasn't because he was cheap, which you might get when you first start reading his book, this impression that he may be just cheap. He's not. He talks about that we all need to start with four basic things. Food, shelter, clothing, and fuel. Specifically, the fuel that he's talking about in this instance would be firewood, okay? For cooking and for warmth. <clears throat> he says it's interesting that we can take these four things, food, shelter, clothing, and fuel, and they could be so inexpensive, so minimal, and yet, any one of these can also be extremely elaborate, he, uh, expensive. He said, take, take food, for example. He has this story I'll share in a second, it, um, chapters of his book, talking about growing green beans. It's like a love story. This guy loves tending his green beans. It's so poetic, it's so, it's so interesting. I keep laughing at myself because it's green beans. And it cost him, and he would, and he would chat about how much money it would cost him and how much he would sell for. And it's very interesting. But he says, but yet, we can see with the extremely wealthy on how much it could, it could be a burden the food can be, price-wise. Shelter, same thing. I'm gonna show you a picture of his house in a minute. But you can follow along, right? We could have an apartment, we could have a small house, or you could have um, a mansion. Do we 
Do we own our house or does our house own us? Is what he would say. Clothing. This is kind of funny. He says something along the lines that his heart truly goes out to the wealthy, the extremely wealthy, the royalty, who has never had the privilege to wear a suit more than once, to never know what it feels like to have a well-broken-in suit or to have a, a pair of clothes that just fits you in all the right places. He says, my heart goes out to those who, who never can experience that. Um, I would think no less of a man if they had a patch on their knee or an extra stitch in their clothes. Absolutely fascinating. Do we own our clothes or do our clothes own us? Us is what he would say. And the fuel is only transponded into today of, of you know, I, I often think about sanctuaries. I think about sanctuaries and how we have these beautiful buildings with the high ceiling. And, 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 it's, and, and you think if, if we put a drop ceiling in, it would be a lot cheaper to keep this room. <laughs> do we worship in the church or do we worship the church do we do we um, do we have these things in our lives that are so good but do they get a little out of control where where it's controlling us just one more quick little story he would share the same kind of idea like when you're plowing a field plow a field by hand rather than with a horse. He said, if you do, then you now tend horses or mules. And now you have to, have to even plow more to not only sustain yourself, but now to sustain the horse. He's trying to find that area in his life that's bringing him serenity and time alone with God to the extreme. And as I would say, we're not to mimic him. If everybody did what he did, there'd be some problems, I would think. But it is an, because he's so extreme, there's an invitation for us to say, maybe I need to work a little harder at living and a little less harder at making money. I learned this at least by my experiment that if one advances uh, confidently in the direction of his dreams and endeavors to live the life which he has imagined, he will meet the success unexpected in common hours. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Right? Like the song. Christians are so often worried about finding God in the tomorrow. He has a beautiful quote. He said, the Christian is always looking for God in the tomorrow. Is God any less divine in the now? For I say to you, God is no, if, if God is any less divine, it would be in the past and in the future. But it would be blasphemy to say that God is not as in full divinity in the now. In this time, in this place. I don't know what struggles you all have, but I know you all have struggles. May we be lifted up knowing that God meets us in full of his divinity in the now. Here's some quick chapters. I'm not going to go much more on this, but he had um, one of them is called Economy and how he, he spends a lot of time on how he, how he can fund him the ways that he does. He, he built his house by his own hands. Here's a picture of his house. Um, so I'll just read the titles quick. Economy, where I live and what I live for. That's a good question for us, isn't it? Where I live and what do I live for? That, that could be... If we didn't have open hearts, open minds, open doors as our slogan in the church, this would be a nice one, isn't it? Right? It's basically saying the same thing. Sounds of the be bean field. You could change it to a woman's name and you think it was a love story rather than a green bean. And visitors. He was a, wasn't a hermit and he would entertain at times 20 people or so in this house that he built by hand. Interesting, huh? I don't know how they will fit in there. I think he might be exaggerating. He built the house um, for $28.21 and a hay penny, if I remember correctly, my notes up at the pulpit. Um, which actually, during that time period, was about, um, for an average person, or a working person, would be about one year's rent. So it sounds really cheap, but, but it was about a year's worth of rent. Um, he would say, that he was talking about Harvard, I think it was, and he said that the, the, the ch those young students at the dorm spend $30 for their... $30, Danielle, live in the dorm. His house was 28 He says, perhaps these students would be better well taught if they had to build their own lodging. 
perhaps that would help their education, learning how to live life if they built their own dwelling. And he says, and I am not suggesting that we turn our scholars into, into, into day workers. He says, but rather I'm trying, I am saying that there would be something to be learned for us all if we became more independent. I fear that with the invention of the horse and buggy that we have forgot how to use our two feet. <laughs> That's his room. Isn't that interesting? He would clean the floor with, uh, with pond sand and, um, and, and he would uh, brush and, and bring the wood out. So it stayed simplicity. I think he had three chairs. Yep, there they are. Three-legged table. And he, and he takes much, um, and, and, he, and he took much pride in the fact that he built it himself and the windows were used. He bought them used. Um, this, I don't believe, is the actual build. I think, I think it's totally re rebuilt, but... How vain it is to sit down to write when you have not stood up to live. That's a pastor's problem when they're sitting down at their desk trying to come up with the next sermon, right? That's why the pastor said, I need to do a little searching. If I'm preaching of this joy that God has, am I truly living it? And you may think you're truly living it, but I realize only when you take a step back do you realize that there's more. How vain it is to sit down and write when you have not stood up to live. He believed that, as, a, as I'm a philosophy major and he's a philosopher, he said, if unless you live it, then you're not truly a philosopher. So I would say to us, unless we live it, are we not truly Christians? It has to be more than just the ink from our pen. I want to live deep and suck out the marrow of life. I want that too. You? Here's the good news. The invitation has been given to us. Now, here's the question. Do we, does our heart leap like it does by the psalmist? I would ask you all to join me as we read this psalm together and to ask yourself, is this true? Is this true? Someone else is writing, or is this my walk, my profession? Would you join with me? Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them, full of honor and majesty, is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is never ever mindful of the covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nation. The good works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name, the fear of the Lord meaning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Amen.